Hinges are a fundamental part of all kinds of parts, but did you know you can actually make the hinge a part of a part? It's called a living hinge, and if you put a living hinge in any sort of part, you can make those parts actually have a party. So let's pick that apart. So there's a lot of different types of living hinges, but inside of 3D printing, you have all kinds of different options because you have a lot more control of the pieces that you're making and the designs that they're able to make. The most traditional living hinge is literally just a thin flap of material, which is made very thin so that it can flex without actually fatiguing. These type of living hinges though do have an issue because they wear out. They're often used on something like old tackle boxes or small enclosures, and they're fine with traditional manufacturing, but they can't be used many, many times, and they can't flex through very long distances, otherwise they break like that. And while that's not an ideal situation you wanna have in a lot of parts, you can do it inside of 3D printing with certain types of materials. So a typical living hinge can be done with like TPU or polypropylene or other types of materials so it can be mass produced and create a good reliable piece. But you also have to consider the orientation of the part. It can only be printed on its side, which can limit it to some degree. There are some variations of that where you can still have a living hinge and have it be reliable, but it's a difficult type of geometry to kind of have to work with. and Fundamentally, it's not very good engineering because it is a point of fatigue that'll eventually wear out. And there's so many other options when you have 3D printing. You can reduce the wear on a particular living hinge just by giving it more material to wear on. So like in the case of this circular hinge, all you are doing is giving that stress more places to go by giving it a much larger area to work on. Rather than a very small defined point, you have it on a very big broad point. It doesn't give you quite the same range of motion because you can flex stuff a lot more, but it puts an automatic spring into the hinge so that you now have a lid that automatically closes and a lot more play and a lot more flexibility in narrow ranges than the typical type of living hinge would ever provide. But you can take that circular hinge a little bit further and by reducing the amount of material even more and giving it kind of this toothed look, you can give it a lot more flexibility, a lot more longevity and still have the spring return. But by changing the depth of those grooves and the number of those grooves, you can actually kind of change how that hinge behaves. So the circular hinges are another way of doing living hinges. But sometimes that circle will pop out too far into a particular geometry. So you might still want that flexibility with much less protrusion. A long time ago on a project that we did with robots, we actually created a gripper finger using this kind of spring hinge. And this sort of living hinge is very useful because again, you get a good amount of flexibility with very little wear because no single part of the hinge actually has to flex very far. This is a good way of creating like long articulated columns or multiple hinges inside the length of a long thin part so that you don't have to have a single plate of wear like a traditional living hinge but you still have a good amount of flexibility. One of the more traditional hinges is actually the living hinge that you might have seen in like woodworking. And this is where you, you cut individual slats inside of a horizontal plate that is printed just like this. But those individual slats are able to twist and bend around each other. And by creating that twisting motion and freedom within it, you're able to create something really flexible. It's not just a perforated edge where again, the material is flexing directly. It's just twisting these individual areas just a little bit, kind of the way you twist a rope just like this. So this is a copying pattern of basically having a piece of material connected right here and then two edges that bend just like this. So that gives you a lot of freedom. It can bend pretty darn well, but you have to design this actually around the radius that you're trying to bend around. This hinge type is fairly easy to manufacture. It's not ideal because you have so much precision in it, but it can be made very chunky and depending on the end application, it looks really good and it can last a very long time because you have so much distributed motion, you don't have any single force on any single area, so it takes a long time for a hinge like this to completely fatigue and break away. But this is all in the traditional living hinges, and a living hinge is one where you have the material itself flex, and that's not a very good way of making a hinge. What if you could just do the hinge traditionally where it actually moves around an axle? Here, 3D printing has a really fantastic advantage because it's able to make parts inside of other parts without actually having to assemble anything. So you have these hinges where you can have a flexible point moving around a central axle that was all printed as a single piece. These are not screws. Nothing was screwed together. This part was grown like this. Now there's a couple of different ways of doing this. You can print this part vertically just like this, which gives you really nice motion around the central axle to where it's nice and smooth and circular and can be pretty high precision, but it can be tough to kind of design and you have to be really careful to chamfer those inner axes so that you don't have interface or layers falling onto each other. But that can be a little bit weaker because the layer lines are now horizontal. So if you have a lot of torsional force on on this that's not ideal. Just make something thick and make sure you're designing for the process and it's not that big of an issue. But if for some reason you're trying to make this very, very small, then you would want to print it horizontally because then the layer lines are moving through the point of rotation. And now you have basically a traditional solid part. And while you still have the same kind of rotation, it can be a lot rougher. Hear that? 
That's because inside of the axle, there's a little bit of settling that happens. So it becomes a little bit oval. So this is generally for like cheaper applications. So there you can get away with this. And if you have a large hinge door on this, you have so much leverage on it that there's no way it would ever stick or have an issue, but it just isn't as smooth as the vertically printed option. So there you have it. There are all kinds of hinges that can be made. And with 3D printing, you can actually make impossible hinges that are not possible any other way. So depending on what your application is, use the best hinge that works for you based on the profile that you have based on what your requirements are and based on what your cost is, just make sure that you're designing for the process. So springs are pretty useful. So in this video, we're gonna go through and discuss how to design different types of springs and many of the common types of springs that can be designed and mass produced with 3D printing. So we're gonna go over several different types of springs from spiral to torsional to extension type of springs. And 3D printed springs have to be very different from any other types of springs. The one spring that we will never make is a coil spring. Coil springs don't work for 3D printing because you are not able to have a continuous cohesive kind of path in order to create a coil spring you would end up having the layer line split if you printed it vertically, and if you print it sideways, well, you actually can do that, but it's not really a coil spring. It's not combined in the way that you would normally do it. If you wanna create an extension spring, a standard type of coil spring function, what you do is that instead of doing a spiral, you just look at that spiral from the top and create that profile. And now you have a very simple flat pack extension spring. These types of extension springs are really useful if you want to have some sort of resistance on a switch or a button or whatever it happens to be, or if you need something that just gives really easily right there. All it is is a simple curved path going back and forth and you can change how that path works. Most of the time the easiest way to do it is just kind of design a set of pattern slots and make sure you round out the edges. Do make sure you round out the edges. Sometimes people make these springs like perfectly square, but the problem with that is that you then have a stress concentration at those corners. Make sure it's round. Now, do these springs compare to regular circular extension springs? Well, quite frankly, they're not quite as good because regular circular extension springs are phenomenally efficient because they distribute the force perfectly continuously all the way around that coil. Whereas with these types of extension springs, the force is concentrated at the rotation points. So if this breaks, it's gonna break right there, just below the curve where this thing has been. Now, as far as the actual design of these, the easiest way to do it is make these things thicker if you want it to be stiffer, make them thinner down to one millimeter if you want them to be softer. And one other way of making it a little bit tougher is to go from a very flat design to a very thick design, where now you have a lot more material which is able to bend so you can get a lot more resistance than what you would normally have. So those are the traditional kind of extension springs. But there's a lot of ways of rejiggering this because 3D printing lets you create weird and interesting geometries that generally don't come up very often. So what if you want just like a stabilizer ring? This is something where you would like mount something to a wall or to a brick and then you would have the actual item mounted on the inside. It might be some sort of transfer or transmission or just something that you wanna vibrationally stabilize. These types of springs can stabilize in this direction because they're basically a set of extension springs around the outer side or it can serve as like a trampoline where you can mount something up there and then this gives and gives slack in that way, kind of like a membrane. This is a very useful type of spring for push buttons and that kind of stuff. If you had a box and you wanted to have a push button on the inside, you can design this type of spring so that this becomes the big red power button for the box and then depresses whatever is underneath. So that's kind of the utility of these types of springs. Now we start getting into other types of very traditional types of springs. Leaf springs. Leaf springs are another sort of mounting, stabilizing sort of spring where you want something to stay in position for the most part with a little bit of compliance. These can both compress and also slide side to side. They can be very useful because with leaf springs, you're able to create items where you want kind of tight control. You can create effectively like parallel mechanisms with leaf springs so that you can keep the orientation of a part in the same place as you move and depress it around. So leaf springs are useful for creating kind of controlled mechanisms while still having all the vibration, dampening, deadening, and return that you want from traditional types of springs. However, these can be really finicky. You only have one or two bands of material to work with. So changing their strength is generally only through thickening something up. And now these can be really useful because a leaf spring is basically the material itself flexing by itself. So a leaf spring can be anything from a flat printed plate that's then bolted into place to these nicely little designed rings that again are printed in plane. This is the most important thing with 3D printed springs. 
All of the force has to be in plane along the layer lines to make sure that you don't have something snapping off. If you try to print this spring at an angle, you just ruined the spring. It has way less return. But leaf springs are terribly useful. And then last, but certainly not least, spiral springs. Very often you see these in clocks. These springs are generally energy storage devices. As compared to all the other ones, which are stabilizers, vibration deadening, that kind of stuff, coil springs are really about storing up energy because you have all these coils very dense packed. And again, you can make these springs thicker so that you can store up a lot more energy inside of these. So wind up toys, mechanisms for lids, all those types of things can be done with coil springs. It's a very tight, compact way of getting twisting motion into a space. You can make the whole feed thicker in order to make it much stiffer on the outside if you're just wanting a spring for like opening a lid and then closing a lid or you can make it thinner, have many more coils, and then make it thicker in this direction in order to create much more energy storage. But those are the primary types of springs that you will see with 3D printing. One side benefit of almost all of them is that since they are printed flat, many of them can be printed within a print themselves. So if you have some plastic part that has been printed like this, you can continue printing the spring inside of the part and fully encase it in a way that you cannot with other processes. So you're effectively assembling a machine as it's being actually manufactured. So you can have springs embedded inside a system so that you now have have a deadening, dampening feature inside of the part that otherwise would have had to be installed or built in three pieces or something like that. 3D printing lets you grow up an entire part with springs and mechanisms inside of it, which is pretty darn cool and something that has never been possible for with traditional manufacturing. So how do you actually design some hinges? Today we're gonna go through that and probably show you some hinge designs that you've never seen before. So hinges are pretty darn useful, but they're actually quite challenging to do inside of 3D printing because you have to deal with orientation as well as the strength of the hinge. So we're gonna start with kind of the least complex going up to the most complex types of hinges and how they can be useful and in what context they can be used. Well, one of the easiest ones is just a simple mechanical linkage. You have a loop and you have a solid rod going through the middle. Now, the trick with this is that it does have to be printed in this orientation. This orientation is super important because you need that center pen inside of there that is the crossbar you want that to be in the plane of the layers because if we print it like this it's no longer in the plane of the layers so it could potentially break off if you just have a central hinge because it'll tear out through the layers now there's ways of dealing with that and we'll get to that here in another couple of hinges but whenever doing this sort of hinge you want to print it effectively horizontally and you can create a really good reliable hinge but Gabe what if I don't want to print it like that what if I do have a box and I need to print it up on edge well, now you can use one of the more unique sort of hinges. This hinge is basically a cone-shaped hinge. You can see that even though it's level there, I can't actually pull it out of the hole that it's inside of. And the reason for that is that the inside of this actually splays out and is coned so that it's all print in place, but you still have freedom of motion and no side travel. It's still all retained, it's still all constrained, it's held together, but you get really good free flow motion in the vertical. Now, the issue with this is, is that this is a weaker hinge. Right now, all the layer lines are like this. So if I twist really hard right here, I can potentially break off this hinge. But again, if you make it large and chunky, you can compensate for that a little bit. And there's one more hinge type that is actually way better at getting this done. That hinge type is this one right here. This hinge is basically two cones on the top and on the bottom. And what this allows you to do is create a really robust contact point that doesn't have leverage. This can break off because there's a lot of leverage on that arm. All of the force from down here is applied up here so you can break right at that corner up here at the top. But this one doesn't have a lever arm on it. The cones going into it are only about a couple millimeters or so. So you have a lot of motion and a lot of strength here and you're never gonna break this off. Now the challenge with this type of a hinge now is since it's not constrained the way this one is, this is a cone going up to the top and it's free, this one doesn't really have any overhangs that are an issue. This one has overhangs that are an issue and can cause fusing inside of the part. Even right here you can kind of see the messiness because the top loop has to settle onto this bottom loop. And that causes an issue because now you have the material kind of falling down onto the other one so that one link of the hinge kind of acts as support for the other link of the hinge. This is not the end of the world, but it's not very robust. So there's a few things that you can do to kind of readjust around this. 
The way of doing that is basically taking this hinge and then just making the second half of it so that you have cone and then back up and then cone again. This way you are able to create something that doesn't really have the overhangs because everything blends into itself. And even though you have that center spiral, it can't break off because you have that baseline chamfered and really strong and reliable. So it's kind of a hybrid of this just standard one which is cones on top and then a center area and then a bottom. You actually connect to those two top cones so it's a lot easier. The other thing that you can do in order to to refine this even more is to put one cone on the bottom and then one cone on the top of the other link. This way you have nothing falling down onto the print at all. It's all just perfect vertical roofs that are a lot more reliable to print with. And the one other option is to again change orientation. This hinge right here has the top link falling down on the bottom. This hinge is this hinge but printed on its side. This allows you to now put those cones in plane. And since those cones are inside of there and they're cones, they have no overhang again. So you end up with a really tight and reliable hinge. This linkage is really good for high tolerance parts and pieces, but this is printed on its side. Whereas this one is printed in this orientation, this one is printed in this orientation as if this was on its side. This is really strong, really robust hinge, generally has really good tolerances, but again, it has to be printed like this, which can be limiting because sometimes you have a hinge going up the spine of some sort of apart. But if you ever have to print something vertical like this, you need to be really wary of the overhangs because you cannot rely on slicer settings of it works on my machine. Why doesn't it work on this machine? It's just not robust because different materials, different dyes, everything can change how that interaction occurs. So you want to make a robust print that's really reliable. So hopefully that gave you some insight around how to design different sorts of hinges and the things that you can do with them. The reason this is so important is because there's a lot of applications where you don't want to be reliant on your particular 3D printer. If you wanted to upload something like this to our teleport plugin, where you want to sell a bunch of them, but you don't want to have to run a print farm, you just upload the model and then when a customer orders it, we print and ship it to them for you. If you want to do that, you need a robust model because our machines are not your machines. You want the model itself to be reliable and not have to rely on the slicer settings or the material or anything else. Just design well and all the slicer settings become irrelevant. This model done well, like this, can be printed at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 resolution with any sort of infill and with any sort of material and it will still work just fine. That is the power of really, really good design. So hopefully that helps you out. Have a great day, everybody.